Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, can you all hear me okay? What? Huh? I guess I have the question of like all of you didn't get this. Um, I'm Doug Kenneth. It's my pleasure to be here in this lovely room with a bucket and dripping water. Um, but I, hopefully we'll be able to talk about how to engage and grow your audience beyond just blogging. Uh, so let's get started. A little bit about me, I'm the CEO of a web hosting company called Small Arms. We have about 35 employees around the world, um, 25 of which are remote, and about 10 of which are in our Durham, North Carolina headquarters. I used to run customer service at a little hosting company called HostGator, um, and I've done customer service consulting. I've blogged about customer service. Um, I'm actually mainly in town for the hosting industry conference, HostingCon, um, which is this upcoming week. Uh, but I've been a WordPress user for a number of years, and um, I want to talk about this. I live in Durham, North Carolina. Um, I'm a huge <coughs> Devils fan, a tech geek, and I'm Devil Tan on Twitter if you want to follow me. Um, so now that you guys know a little bit about me, I want to know a little bit about the audience. And I can't really see because there's a blinding light, um, but maybe I can squint and see. So first of all, who here is from the Boston area? Wow, OK, I'm not. Um, what about out of state? Anyone from out of the country? Where? Montreal. Okay, so Canada. Um, that's cool. They do. Canada is a nice place. Um, at least in the summertime. Uh, how long have people been using WordPress? So, like, relative beginner, six months or less. A fair number of people. A year or so. Uh, more than two years. Okay, so mostly fairly experienced people. And then my final question is, who uses WordPress for themselves versus an organization? So who does it for themselves? Most people. What about an organization of some sort? And of those people that said organization, how many of those are higher ed? Fair number. Okay, cool. So let's kind of just take a, a look at high-level blogging here. So. Blogging in theory is pretty easy. WordPress makes it even easier. You kind of go to wordpress.com, or you download wordpress.org, you get a great web hosting company, and then it's easy to start. But it's getting started is once you get started, how do you build that audience? Um, and what I've found and what kind of we've seen what, from our customers and from blogs we've done is that success prior, requires a lot of practice, planning, and patience. Um, and then overnight success, with a couple of, I guess, minor exceptions, uh, generally doesn't happen. And it's definitely not also a get-rich-quick scheme. Uh, there are probably more lucrative business opportunities out there than blogging. Uh, so if, if you're in it for rich, riches, maybe fame you can get, but riches are harder. Um, blogging is not going to do that. And if it is going to do any of those, it's going to take a little time. And it's not going to be something that will just happen overnight or even in a week or a month. So today I'm going to be offering a bunch of suggestions that um, may help you expand your your meager audience from a scattered collection of bots <laughs> to a, a more a bots and relatives to a kind of legitimate measurable following that you can kind of capitalize on for what, whatever your respective goals are. Um, so first of all, we want to ask ourselves some questions. Those questions can, are kind of along the lines of why is blogging important to me? So if you raise your hand and you're blogging for an organization, that answer is probably different than if you're blogging for yourself and might be the same employee. So that's, that's a good reason. Um, what kind of information are you sharing? Is this a very personal blog where you're kind of trying to build your own brand or are you trying to um, share very objective information about like how to fix air conditioning at least or something uh, more pragmatic? Uh, why does it matter? Why are people coming to your blog and reading your content? Uh, why, why are you kind of that subject matter expert appointed or um, or maybe it's more meritocratic. Um, is there an angle? Are you looking to gain a job? Are you looking to gain business? What What are those goals? And then subsequently, are your, is your goal more readers, more business, something or other? Like at the small arm, we mainly blog to promote our web hosting brand, and we do that to get customers. My blog more actively about customer service. I did it to get consulting clients. So individual people um, who read my blog were great, but it, it kind of the angle was something very different from just pages or whatever. Uh, advertising was never, never a big money driver when I was a blogger. Um, and then similar to that, once you've done that and you've kind of gone through that question answering, asking and answering process, uh, you want to define some clear metrics for success. So again, I measured my success when I was blogging about customer service 
in terms of consulting clients and consulting dollars. Um, I, if I got like three consulting clients a year, it was worth my time blogging. But if I had a million page views and none of them converted to bloggers or converted to clients, that wouldn't have been my potential for success. Um, and then, if you have no structure and no foresight, and when you go into blogging, the result's going to be no ideas, kind of infrequent posting, and subsequent release in a damaged blog that people are uh, very, very unlikely to want to continue to read. And those are some of the, the common pitfalls that you really want to try and avoid. Um, one way to avoid those pitfalls is to work on finding your community. So blogging is, is ideally a two-way conversation, a two-way dialogue, um, that, that leads to some sort of conversation. So you need to think about your community. And speaking of your readers, you need to ask questions like, who are they? Um, who do they? Who do you want to reach? Um, what are sites that your readers might enjoy that are similar to yours? And what do you do? And what do those sites do versus what you do? And then you want to take a look at, to do that, where your visitors are coming from. What kind of conversations are they having or not having? And what type of uh, content are getting their attention? So going through that kind of process with my service and title blog, um, my readers are mostly customer service managers at um, medium to large companies. Uh, they were finding these kind of word of mouth and search engines. Um, and other sites they write were very customer service, service centric. And they appreciated content that was kind of very pragmatic and high level. And also uh, another group of that was very detailed content that they could kind of take back to their organization. So once I kind of had that, and I was able to figure that out after a couple months of blogging, uh, then I was able to, to really get, get to work and, and blog about things that would actually appeal to my audience. Um, similarly, you want to keep your target specific. Uh, so if you're asking these questions, uh, you can define your target audience and kind of these marketing demographics of women 18 to 34 is not helpful. And sure, if you blog about I don't, I don't know, you can pick something, let's say non stereotypical to avoid gender biases. Monster cars, and you think your, your audience is women 18 to 34, that's fine, but you're probably going to want to be more specific. Women 18 to 34 who like monster cars. Um, and that way you're not, that way your target is, that way you have more of a target to a broad generalization of people. Um, where do your readers come from? What organizations do they belong to? What websites do they frequent? Where do they work? Why is their content important to them? So if you're blogging about, uh, I don't know, interior decorating, Pinterest is going to be a good site for you to kind of think about the, the community there and the readers there. I'll get into more into social media a little bit later. Um, an effective blog isn't going to try and appeal to everyone. And blogs are great for mixed publications and kind of that long tail of content. So it's important to think about that um, as you're blogging and as you're thinking about your readers. Um, and the closer you look at your readers and the more insights you have into who they are, uh, the clearer your ideas are going to be when you plan out um, content topics. Um, a helpful tool for finding like-minded blogs is a double-click ad planner. Has anyone used that before? Yep, so there's a new one. Um, which can help you to clearly define your audiences by demographics and interests. Um, it can also kind of connect you with data regarding unique user page news and other data for a bunch of websites. And again, that's called and I'll post these slides in the notes. So that's called the double click ad plan. Um, then, obviously, a crucial step of blogging is delivering uh, good content. And you can call it interesting, helpful, insightful, world changing, whatever, however you want to describe it. Content that applies that appeals to your readers. Um, your content is kind of the engine that's driving your blogging effort. So you need to make it worth reading, but also equally importantly, worth sharing. So at a small arc, we use our blog to kind of provide our readers, who are most of our customers, potential customers, uh, with useful tips to help them create the best websites they can. Because our business objective is if our customers are creating best, the best websites they can, they're going to need posting. So we want to we want to encourage that. Your objectives might be different. Um, so that means posts about design, programming, WordPress plugins, WordPress in general, Google, whatever. Um, and then we kind of have to ask ourselves and go through this exercise of what makes your content useful. So what, what's your area of expertise? And is your motivation to, to motivate or to entertain or to provide information? It's all different and there's not a right answer for anybody, but it's something to think about. Um, similarly, you want to think about delivering a wide variety of content. So you can do podcasts, you can do videos, you can do ebooks. Um, I've had a lot of success with, with white papers. 
infographics if you, if you know of some or if you have access to a great graphic designer photo gallery that we show on pages. Um, so keeping your post versatile and thinking about the different formats at your disposal, and then planning content around as many of those as you can. Um, podcasts, videos are easy to digest. People don't like reading a lot of times, so and again, it all depends on your audience. Um, and if you have a series of posts, that's also really helpful. I guess people are coming back and it, and then you can refer back to it at a later time. Uh, and it also helps showcase your specific expertise. Uh, so if you, what I've done is I've done a series of posts, maybe four or five versions of it, or four or five posts, and then I put them together into like a PDF ebook. And then I just deliver that free on the site, put a little marketing copy in it, and ideally that gets people to your site. Um, Anyone familiar with this idea of evergreen content? So the idea behind evergreen content is uh, their posts contain valuable information that are built for long-term reference. Uh, so think about how you can add value to your posts that do that. So if you're blogging about something, um, maybe back to our, our previous example of, of monster cars, and you're, you're blogging about that, you might want to talk about how to change the tire of a monster car. And that's something that anyone can refer to. It's probably not going to change a lot over time. It's not new, but it's going to be a good way to be able to send readers when they come to your site. They're either going to be looking for data like that or information like that, or you can kind of point them in that direction. Um, an example in the customer service realm would be, I have a quote, a big list of things not to say. So it says, never say no, and says, hey, um, sorry, you can't do this, or whatever. And that's content that's relevant to people if they read a blog every day or once. Um, and if you aren't the only one performing blogging duties, have a short content meeting or checking in on a weekly basis so you and your team can get keep your goals in sight and you can think about some of these things. Um, Keeping it consistent is also really important. Um, and there are different tools of thought on this. And, uh, definitely in the Q&A, feel free to kind of mention what works for you or hasn't. Um, set kind of specific times to post and stick to them. And that, that's going to vary if you, again, if you blog about something that's made more recreational. Weekends might be better for you than we did. Um, and editorial calendar is really important. As a smaller blog, we definitely keep one of those. We have multiple people contributing to our blog. Um, and that helps others stay organized, keep in the loop, it helps our editor plan content and so on. There's a cool plugin called the WordPress Editorial Calendar. Um, and you can just get that from the plugin directory and it kind of helps you through the um, Google Calendar works. Maybe if you're a quantitative person and you think better in Excel, you can use that too. Um, and there are lots of, basically you want to do these things because the internet is obviously full of infinite distractions. Um, inconsistent, unpredictable posting schedules are going to ensure that your blog is kind of forgotten about. And an editorial keep calendar is going to help you keep track of your posting history, what other contributors need to do, and so on. Um, Google Calendar is really a really easy one for most people. Um, and if you really want to go crazy with that, especially if you're kind of maybe a more professional writing organization, you can use something like Asana or Basecamp, uh, which is more project management focused. Um, Commenting and discussion is really important in blogging. That kind of would make the blogging conversation, or blogging as a, as a medium, very different from the publishing out content and news. Um, so you, may, you might want to think of, you may think of your blog as a platform for you and your business ideas, uh, but your post should ultimately end up as a conversation between you and your, your visitors, uh, no matter how important you are. And I know a lot of very important bloggers who still take time to get respond to comments. Because that, that really gets people, it gets people from the loyalty to you and your blog and it gets them coming back. Um, and you always want to encourage discussion. And you can always just do that with a simple line or two at the end of your post. What do you think about this? Have you seen it? Um, and you, if you can make your questions a little bit more specific, like um, if I was blogging about this, like what are some strategies that have worked well for you and what are some that haven't worked well? Um, and that's really a good way to make it so people don't have to think about what they're going to say and what they're going to comment on. And instead, they're more responding to something a little bit more straightforward. Um, who uses the kismet on the blog? Wow, I think not as many as I was expecting. So it comes bundled with WordPress. Um, it's a great plugin for keeping your blog spam free, um, which kind of helps have some tangential effects of boosting your SEO and saving you a lot of time. So my kismet on server compiled has lost something like a million spam comments since I started blogging. Um, and if I didn't have it, those would have been comments I would have to read manually. So a million times a second is a long time. Um, you can do the math if you want. 
Um, and if you're commenters on your own blog, also kind of commenting and discussion chain, um, you can just return the paper and go to their blog and comment and kind of contribute to their conversation. I did that when I first started blogging about customer service and it was really helpful. Um, sharing ideas with like-minded people can really help build your community. Um, so definitely get in and know, get to know people. And then you might also want to consider um, enabling comment moderation. You can do that right from the discussion thing. Um, option of WordPress, and that's going to help keep things on track and ensure that people are not getting lost in kind of irrelevant discussion. Um, another fine way to build community is through finding guest posting opportunities. So it's a good relationship builder, again, with kind of those fellow bloggers in your space or maybe related to your space in some way. Um, it's also an opportunity to get your work seen by other wider audiences in other communities, and it can really give you some good search engine optimization through backlinks. So remember to include a link with your, with your content that you submit to others. Um, don't forget to return the favor and feature guest posts on your blog as well. Um, otherwise, people might get a little suspicious or frustrated with that. And definitely provide your readers with kind of a diverse table of voices. Uh, that's going to help keep your content right. So what I do on service and title is the guest readers that we or guest writers that I generally have for guys that have decades of experience in customer service, which I, I don't have, um, or people who had very quantitative backgrounds and kind of thought about all those three-letter acronyms that were important in customer service that I really try to stay away from. Um, so it kind of gave people a mix of different experiences and styles, and it helps keep the readers interested. Um, when you're reaching out for guest post opportunities, though, make sure it's clear that it's you doing this to grow your blog's reputation, um, because a lot of guest posts now are from link builders who kind of write very crappy guest posts, and they're just trying to get down links for whatever website is paying them. Um, obviously, social media is, is hugely popular and hugely to promote your blog. Um, there are millions and millions of people, billions probably, um, engaged in social media. So it's a key way to promote your blog. First, you need to figure out which kind of platforms are best suited for your blog. Um, creating a profile kind of on every social media site, no command, is going to be, um, it's going to just be one way to get distracted and disorganized. My customer service blog does not need an interest profile, probably, the audience that I'm looking out for is not going to be there. So they will be on LinkedIn. So I kind of need to think about that as I'm, as I'm designing my blog and thinking about uh, what things I'm gonna, what social media sites I'm gonna try and get on to get after them. Um, and keep your circles and communities organized so you know who you're reaching and kind of stock your profile and network appropriately. Um, so there are a couple of social icon plugins that you might want to consider for WordPress. A couple are dig, dig, get social, and share this. Um, there's also one integrated with uh, Jetpack, which is kind of the automatic product. Uh, they're all pretty good. Um, they serve largely the same purpose, um, and they're customizable. Kind of trying to use the number of icons you put on your site sparingly, because if there's like 50 icons on every post, or like um, some obscure site, but A, they're not going to get used, and they're just going to slow down your website. Um, you also want to use the social media management tool. Does anyone need something like Hootsuite before? Yeah, so. Let, let the members speak for themselves, it's a great product, um, and it will really help you kind of keep track of, make very easy to post and kind of aggregate all those different social media networks together. So, um, you don't have to play guess the password, if you just want to do a simple check-in, it's very simple, um, and it will help you kind of stay very involved in the different social media communities that you're looking for. Um, social bookmarking communities are also helpful. Um, Stumble upon is still big. I, I, I have no idea why it's still so popular, but it is. Um, Reddit is big, is dying. Big is dying. Reddit is still pretty popular. Um, but these are going to help drive traffic to your blog, especially if you kind of have um, content that might appeal to some of these more niche audiences. So think about that. Um, they're, you, they have lots of content, um, and at the very least, they're going to give you some post inspiration so you can find like, a very specific niche that might appeal to you, like there's a bunch of subreddits, I'm not sure there's one on business, um, and that could give you some great post ideas. Um, learn your rules of the community, or you will get um, flamed, essentially, and, and thrown out, and probably blacklisted, and really ugly. Um, and make friends, and keep it genuine, so you want to contribute to other content in the same way that you're posting your own content. So don't post every post of yours, only post posts that you think are going to be relevant and helpful um, to that community, whatever it is. Um, make subscribing simple. If you don't have a big RSS button on the front of your site, get one. 
Um, you can just drop it in for a widget, or or you can download a plugin for it. Google Feed Burner is going to help give you some information on not only how many people subscribe to your blog, but it's going to help manage that. Um, and it's going to help give you some statistics on subscribers, multiple subscription options, yes, and all these different things. It's a good product, it's free, it's been around a really long time, and it seems to work well. Um, and then RSS, it's probably losing a little bit of favor if more people are moving towards social media, but it's still large, especially if you still have like kind of more old school corporate, um, corporate audience that's opposed to like maybe a bunch of teenagers or something. Um, Tracking traffic is important. So as your blog develops, it's going to be something you'll want to do. You'll want to know more about your audience and their behavior. Google Analytics is probably the best tool for doing this. It's free. It's, free. it's easy enough to use, depending on how detailed you want to get. Um, and you want to you should think about um, spending some time and money to kind of keep up with this and plan for it longer term. Um, Raving tools is another one. And what it does is it provides a more comprehensive suite of tools than um, that combines Google Analytics with a bunch of social media measurement stuff. So if social media becomes an important component of your site, it's something you want to think about. Um, there's a nominal fee for rating tools. It's not prohibitively expensive, but um, it's, again, if social media is a big part of your site um, and where your traffic is coming from, it's definitely something to think about pretty seriously. Um, Another one here is blog optimization. So blogs are great for SEO, and they're, they're, you should really not underestimate the SEO power of, of blogging. Um, so WordPress SEO by Yoast is uh, kind of probably the, kind of the, the biggest plugin for WordPress SEO. It has a ton of options to basically point and click and get your blog optimized for SEO. Um, there are others um, in general. So. Like some, some things that Yoast does is it has optimization options for content, images, meta descriptions, and more. And what it helps you do is do a lot of these things automatically instead of having to think about every time you write a post, do I need to add this metadata, do I need to do this, etc. Um, and you can try it out. They also have a tutorial on their website. Um, and then there's also a search engine optimization page for WordPress, the WordPress codex. Uh, that is a bunch of tips on, on how to do some of this, either manually or through different plugins and so on. Um, sites like SEO Mods are great for learning about SEO. SEO Book has kind of free downloadable tutorials, uh, and they can, they can teach you all about this. Uh, if your blog is well optimized, you'll see a large percentage of your traffic coming from search engines. And then there are different plugins that you can also install that will help you, um, like if someone comes from a search engine, that will help get people more engaged with the rest of your content. And some things, ways to do that as well, to really make sure those Google users that are coming in don't down. Consider like the most popular posts or highlights of the week or year or month, whatever. And those are basically so if someone Googles again like monster truck car tire changing, um, then they come to your site and they, they see most popular posts about other topics and then they can really get engaged more with your content instead of coming back or favoriting it for that particular post. Um, Another one is you should consider asking your readers if they want. So check in with your readers to see what changes they'd like to see to your blog. Um, there are a bunch of ways to do this. Um, I meant Google Docs, sorry. Google Docs is a very simple, quick and dirty surveying tool. Um, SurveyMonkey has one. Um, Cold adding an automatic product is really good. It's premium. Um, and they're all pretty easy to use. And they give you plenty of ways to break down the data you can do cohorts and all this um, complicated statistical stuff if you want to. Um, but also, they're just as simple as saying, did you like this post, yes or no? Um, or do you want to see more content about X, Y, or Z? So that's something to think about and that I think is, um, is pretty relevant uh, as, as you especially build your blog and community. Promoting your blog where you promote yourself is going to be a good way to get your audience uh, built initially, especially. No one really likes a blade self-promoter, but um, people will tolerate minimal forms of it. So put links to your blog in your email signature, on your business card, on your social media profiles for yourself. Um, and then within your blog, kind of like I was mentioning earlier, link to some of your blog popular posts that you are offering. Um, and obviously, with the chronological format of blogs, it makes it very hard 
and if you have hundred or even thousands of posts that people share, to really dive into each of them, spending a lot of time. And doing things like this helps get them more engaged with your blog and your content site, as opposed to just a uh, kind of a collection of your posts. And it will get them spending more time on your site and hopefully leading to whatever objectives you want. So if your blog is in your email signature, um, definitely consider putting it there. There's not a whole lot of downside and it will get you some readers, especially I guess spend a lot of email. Um, and then you also want to consider meeting up with your readers. This is going to depend on the size, scope, scale, all these different things of your audience. So if you blog about um, Boston cooking or something like that, then it might be more feasible to have an audience to have some sort of in-person meetup, whereas if you blog something about like I do customer service, um, it's kind of like a lonely meetup if I have one, I don't know if you where I was, but um, I could certainly consider a Skype meeting or a Google Hangout and do some of my more active commenters, and, uh, and that helps things like that. So, um, don't let those, um, don't let maybe a wide geography of your blog limit you too much because there's lots of things you can do, do it. And even if you if you have a kind of a local appeal, you don't want to get super fancy and like ran out to the fancy restaurants or really the menu. menu. Um, and instead you can just get together for coffee or maybe at um, a place that regularly hosts host some sort of meetup and you can go from there. Um, so that's, that was most of what I have. And I'm, I'm happy to take and answer any questions you might have. We have, uh, I don't know, maybe about 10 to 12 minutes for questions. And maybe we can get some good questions. Uh, we can give away some web hosting from Walmart. So um, I'm, I'm willing to bribe. Thank you. I think the, the video people want, want people to go to the microphone. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so in case people had trouble hearing, uh, the, the, the lady asked, how many times should you blog, how often should you blog? Um, and that's going to depend on your audience. I used to publish five days a week at their titles, and then I got busier, and then I'm like, okay, I'm going to kind of publish three days a week. Am I traffic any good now? So I had 40% less effort with the same results, and I would encourage you guys to seek out similar methods. Um, so if you can do that, definitely consider it. Um, and again, a lot of a lot of a lot of this is there's no right answer for, for everybody, but um, you might want to start off more and then go less and, and do it over some sort of time where you can track it over time. And see me, and we'll get you a posting account. <laughs> well, it looks like at Planner you mentioned that was a tool for not only exploring what your site could, could, could uh, really work on the content. Could you, could you go into that a bit more? I went to the site right away when you sent it and, and checked it out. And it looks like you can um, look at other sites to see what they're bringing in. So you're suggesting we go to similar sites with content that you feel is similar to ours and then go along those lines? Yeah, you want to think about kind of the competitive landscape, different types of sites and how they kind of can, can contribute and, and give you insight about your site. So if I blog about customer service and I use double quick app planner to A, discover those sites or B, learn more about those sites, that can help hopefully help narrow down some of those questions to my own blog. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Great. Do your blogs mostly appear in reverse chronological order and with everything on one page or should uh, each post be a tone link with a little blur and tone? Yeah, so the, the typical blog obviously kind of appears, like you mentioned, in this reverse chronological order where the newest post um, is the first thing you see. And there are a bunch of different schools of thought on that. Um, I guess if you want a more traditional blog, it would be more likely to, to show up that way. But if there's no WordPress has function built into it, right, automatically, where you can just consider a static homepage. And what we always encourage, what I always try and do, is you can test different options. So if you find that people are engaging more into your site with a well-designed static homepage, that's a great way to do it as opposed to just um, accepting uh, as the reserve chronological order that was kind of the, the standard. Hi, Jeff. Um, I am interested to hear more about how blogging generated leads for you. Do you have a call for action in the widget on the sideboard, or were these people that were starting to dialogue with you in the comments and build a relationship with them, or how did, how did that become a lead generator? Yeah, so I try to do it subtly. Um, I wanted to give people a reason to continue to read my blog. 
and I never let kind of my goals for consulting clients affect uh, the type of content I produce. So like one would think potentially that because I want to consult the clients, I would never go into too much depth about anything. That would eliminate consulting clients, but um, that I didn't care about that because I felt I had value to deliver beyond just what was in the post, and people who just wanted the post didn't have a need for someone with my background. Um, so what I did is I had a consulting page kind of on the top level navigation, and um, that, was a, that was about it. And so anyone who kind of read and engaged the blog regularly would certainly see that, and occasionally, and I mentioned on the contact page too, that if they had consulting questions, that they could reach out to me and that I'd be happy to do it. Um, but there, there was, I tried to keep it pretty subtle so it's not the alienated readers who didn't need it. And also not to generate a bunch of what would potentially be bad leads because it was an expensive service and I didn't have time to, to give free advice to people <laughs> that, that are like, oh, customer service is cool. Yeah. Uh, when just starting out, uh, what are the sort of capacity constraints with like hosting? Like, plan to start a blog and you hope it becomes really successful, uh, there's some pitfalls of trying to go real cheap in the beginning versus, you know, then trying to migrate to something better. So as, as someone who makes his living from owning a hosting company, I want to tell you, get the smallest hosting package you can and upgrade if you need to. Um, I wish all of our customers would buy the best hosting package they could and buy 10 dedicated servers for every WordPress blog they buy. Um, and it would make me a lot of money but it would be a terrible fit for them. Um, and I guess it depends. Like if you know you're a company blogger and your company's about to raise $50 million of venture capital and it's gonna be on like ABC News every day for the next month, you might wanna consider that. But if you're like me and you're not that big of a deal, um, get a small share hosting package with a decent reputable hosting company um, and hopefully it, will, it should be fine. And, Again, if you get featured in New York Times, you're going to have to be able to act quickly. But I think the lower chance of that happening is something you just need to balance against what the increased cost would be. And a lot of hosting companies um, have features that can scale up very quickly. So if you're on like a, a cloud account at most hosting companies, um, they have some sort of scaling options that will work well for you. But definitely don't overpay and don't let anyone convince you to overpay. If you want a free cheap hosting account, definitely see me. I have three questions. Okay. So one of the first one's very simple. Okay. Um, at what point in time do you judge your uh, blog or social media campaigns whether they're working? I would think it was the one year mark. That was the first question. Okay. The second question is a little bit pretty simple too. I always heard that it was a bad thing to get your website, your domain name, and your hosting company through the same provide like provider. Okay. And I was wondering if you could share your uh, what does the industry think on that and, and why. And the third thing was are there templates for WordPress.com or org that block out the Google AdSense even if they're premium and uh, you know how like in, uh, if you have a, a WordPress.com website there's going to be Google AdSense um, advertisements right next to what you're blogging about. And I, I wondered if it was the same for, for Kong and YouTube. Is there any way you can get a template? So you don't necessarily want your competitors, yep. whether your service products or solutions, populating at the side of your your website. Yeah. So hopefully I'll remember all three of those. The first the first question was kind of when when do you call it quits or when do you um, when do you consider it success, whatever. Um, Seth Godin wrote a book called The Dip, and I'll save you the 200 pages and $10, basically. <laughs> um, if you're doing something, you're gonna be really tempted to quit when the going gets worse, and then it will go up, but there's no guarantee that it will get better. That's 200 pages. Um, <laughs> so, the answer, the answer to that is not an easy one. Um, and I'm glad it was an audio book, and I was in a long drive. And, and that's a very good um, So, so it, it depends. If your objective blogging is to get a job, I would consider it when you're finished, when you have a job. Um, if your objective blogging is getting leads, then if, for me it would have been something like, I've been blogging for a year, I haven't gotten a lead, I've invested a thousand hours, and I have nothing to show for it, there are probably better marketing techniques. So again, it kind of comes back to this. There's no right answer for every question, but um, if you think about your objectives, kind of like I talked about at the beginning of the presentation, and think about, 
Could you be spending, just like any marketing kind of decision, could you be spending this time, money, effort elsewhere to get better results? And then your third question, I think, or your second question was, do I recommend hosting your, um, buying your domain name, hosting, et cetera, from the same company? Only if it's a small arm. Um, if you don't host it with a small arm, um, there, there are benefits to that. So um, if uh, your hosting company disappeared from the face of the planet, so it's possible, and your kind of portfolio is diversified, um, you have some benefits from there. With domain names specifically, there's a whole bunch of regulations around that, so that tends not to happen. Um, and, and there are definitely some protections built in there, kind of like the FDIC, but for, for domain names. And um, in general, I don't think diversity is, is a bad thing. And um, the pricing is so similar for most that it's not going to hurt you. And then, third question? Templates. Templates. Um, I'm sure it's a violation of WordPress.com's terms of service if you block out their ads without paying to do so. Um, I, I'm pretty sure they let you pay to remove the ads, and um, that would, if that's important to you, um, that's something to consider. And obviously, if you have a WordPress.org site from a normal hosting company, they're not going to put any ads on your site that you don't want to. And if you choose to put ads on your site, um, AdSense has a competitive ad filter, so you can kind of say, customer service consultants, I could block all of them out. And then we have a couple of minutes left, so um, happy to get your questions. I know you're the CEO of Small Orange, Okay. Um, I run on a freelancer and I'm like 15 to 20, or I've built 15 to 20 WordPress sites. Um, and I've used so many different hosting companies based on what the client wants, and I usually choose or recommend based on interface and the service of hosting. But why choose a small orange, or why choose a specific hosting company? I'm just wondering because yeah. I, I'm always kind of like judging just based on what I've used. Why? <laughs> so I think next year we're going to do a talk on web hosting. You know, like the <laughs> people. It's pretty relevant to WordPress, though. Um, yeah, there are a bunch of things to think about for hosting companies. I would never go with a hosting company that is ridiculously small um, because they could disappear from the face of the planet, like when a kid's grades get bad and he gets branded by his mom or something. Um, so you don't want to put your business um, at risk with that. Um, Conversely, there are, there are disadvantages to going with a really large web hosting company. Uh, my former employer has like 800 employees now. There's going to be less personal service than from a 35 person company. Um, a lot of hosting companies, the small arms included, uh, you see panels, so the interface is going to be very similar. The best way I, I advocate is pick the tires a little bit, call them up, ask some basic or technical questions, email them, ask some basic, or qu basic questions, and see what sort of results you get. And then most reputable hosting companies are going to have some sort of money back guarantee period. A small arms is awesome because we have great customer service and you can email us any time of day or night and we will respond with a month for that. We have one minute for hopefully one question. Besides double what else do you use for your For like competitive planning? Competitive customer identification. Yeah, so you can use like Pull Daddy to ask questions of your audience directly and find demographic information. Um, Google has a great similar site feature. You can see where your links and traffic are coming from. And kind of if you just look at it, I, there's no one size fits all tool, but if you look at it holistically, hopefully you'll get some good information there. And I think we're, we're out of time, so thank you guys and appreciate it.